In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the first verse, we read these words. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When people say they have faith, it means much more than just believing some propositional truths. It's a whole attitude about the future. It's an attitude of hope. And that's what I'm talking about today. Human beings, as any social scientist will tell you, are unique among all the creatures on the planet. We are the only ones who are capable of imagining the future, of looking ahead. It's both the bane and the blessing of our existence. It's the bane of our existence because we are able to conceptualize death. I mean, animals don't think about dying, and therefore they don't suffer from anxiety. You don't see a squirrel hopping along in a state of existential angst, worrying about death. He just hops and hops and hops, and one day drops over dead. Not like human beings who are afraid of death. And as we look forward to the future, we often see death in very dismal terms. It's this that Jesus came to change. And he called upon us to believe that after death, there would be resurrection. There will be newness of life. Whosoever believeth and trusteth in me, saith the Lord, Though he be dead, though she be dead, yet that person will live. That's the good news of the gospel. Death does not have the final say. As you look to the future, know this, that in Christ there is newness of life beyond the grave. I belong to a black church in West Philadelphia. I grew up in that church. I'm the only white member of this 2,500 member congregation that is black. And I remember when I went to my first black funeral, I was 17 years old, a friend of mine, Clarence, had died. The minister was magnificent. He preached about the resurrection and he, he talked about the life after death in such glowing terms that I got to tell you, even at 17, I wished I was dead just listening to him. He came down from the pulpit and then he went over to the family and spoke words of comfort to them. Last of all, he went over to the open casket and for the last 20 minutes, he preached to the corpse. Can you imagine that? He just yelled at the corpse, Clarence, Clarence, he yelled, and he said it with such authority. I would not have been surprised had there been an answer. Well, he said, Clarence, you died too fast. You got away without us thanking you, and he went down this litany of beautiful, wonderful things that Clarence had done for people. And then he said, that's it, Clarence. When there's nothing more to say, there's only one thing to say. Good night. Now, this is drama. White preachers can't do this. He grabbed the lid of the casket, and he slammed it shut. And he yelled, good night, Clarence. Good night, Clarence. As he slammed that lid shut, he pointed to the casket, and he said, good night, Clarence, because I know, yes, I know that God is going to give you a good morning and the choir stood and started singing on that great getting up morning we shall rise we shall rise and people were up on their feet and they're in the aisles and they're hugging each other and kissing each other and dancing and i was up and i was dancing and i was hugging people and i knew i was in the right church the kind of church that can take a funeral and turn it into a celebration that's what the faith is about it's about the promise of eternal life even in the midst of this life thus death doesn't threaten us anymore. The 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians says this, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Praise be to God that giveth us the victory. The good news of the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that death doesn't have to threaten us. Uh, most people are threatened by death. Uh, Woody Allen once said, uh, I, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> what a good line. None of us want to be there when it happens, but I know what happens beyond death, and that's what the gospel is about. And so the fear, the source of the phobias, as Freud once said, the fear of death which drains the joy out of life, that fear can be destroyed through faith in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Lean on Him. Now, it's not only the bane of our existence, but it's also the blessing of our existence. Being able to see into the future means that we are not controlled by the past. You know, most social scientists believe that what human beings are is nothing more than the product of past experiences. You've heard them. What happened in childhood molds you. 
what happens in your past determines who you are in the present. I believe that the past influences us. I do not believe that the past determines who we are. I would give up tomorrow morning working with inner city kids if I really believed that people were determined by the past. Because most of the young people I work with, armies have marched over them. They've been through hell and back. They've seen brothers and sisters reduced to prostitution and drugs. They've, they've known evil in its worst form. But I've got to tell you, when I talk to those kids, I tell them this. As important as your past may have be, it's not as important as the future. It's the future that matters. Let me tell you this, I say to the kids. It's not as important where you came from as it is in terms of where you're going. What are your dreams, I ask them? What are your visions for the future? Because I'm here to tell you that people are more influenced by their dreams and their visions by, by that than anything that's happened in their yesterdays. I mean, my son, when he was a little kid, he was out shooting a basketball hoop through a hoop. Why? Was he uh, having his behavior positively enforced by rewards? Every time the ball went into the hoop, we gave him a biscuit? No. It wasn't the past that influenced him and got him out there hour after hour shooting that basketball. It was this. He imagined going out for the basketball team in high school someday in the future. It was what he hoped would happen in the future that determined what he was and did in the present. And that's the good news of the gospel. You are not a prisoner of the past. The scripture says you are a prisoner of hope. What you hope for will influence and condition and make you into the person that you want to be. What are your dreams? What are your visions? Because the Bible says without hopes, without dreams, without visions, people perish. And so I ask you to get down on your knees and say, God, give me visions, give me dreams. Help me to imagine what I could be what I could accomplish with your grace, and it's never too late. And let me tell you this. I, I, I was working in Philadelphia. We had uh, seven summer camps in urban neighborhoods with, with disadvantaged, at-risk kids. In each of the camps, we had a basketball team. At the end of the season, I got an all-star team together from all of these respective neighborhoods, and we staged a basketball game against the Philadelphia Eagles football team. It was a good public relations thing. And I staged it out at Eastern University where I teach. And I had them in the dressing room of, of, of Eastern University and we're all, you know, jacking up and getting high uh, to go out and play this game against the Philadelphia Eagles. The kids couldn't believe it. They, these were the stars that they had seen on television and they were going to get to play against them. And I said to these kids, I brought you out here to the college because I want you to imagine yourself playing on this basketball court someday. With God's help, you can do it. And the coach interrupted me, and he said, don't listen to this man. Don't listen to this man. People like that have told me that I could escape from the ghetto, that I could make something of myself. And I tried, he said to these kids. I really tried. And look at me. I'm right back where I started from. So don't let him put fancy dreams into your head. Do you understand? Don't let him put fancy visions in your skull. I hardly knew what to say. And then it came to me, the poem by Silverman. I modified it just a bit. And I said to these young African-American kids who I could see were shocked by their coach, I said to them, listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the never could be's. Listen to the won'ts. Listen to the never have beens, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Now let's go out and play ball. And they did. And that's the good news of the gospel. That Jesus says, I have a future for you. I don't care where you are and or what condition you're in. You're here on this planet because there's good things for you to do. There are great things for you to be. They may not be impressive in the world's eyes, but they are important. Little things. I was in an airport in New Mexico, and this elderly woman was sitting there, sad as could be. I went over and sat next to her and tried to cheer her up. I got her laughing, 
And she laughed so hard, I wondered what would happen. Others in the airport, there's a small airport gathered around, and we all got her laughing. And, uh, and, and she couldn't stop. Her friend came on this little commuter airplane. She hugged her friend, bade us goodbye, went out, got in the car, drove away. I was looking out the glass door, and the car came back up the lane. She came out. She came up to me. She said, Mr., you didn't know this, but it was three years ago today that my husband of 64 years died. And I didn't realize it until I was on the way home that today was the first day since then that I've been able to laugh. And I wanted to come back and thank you. People, it may be something like that, that the world doesn't see as significant, that may be ultimately significant in the long run. There are good things for you to do and be in the future. Put your future in the hands of God. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Hope. Believe in the future.